It's May the 11th, 2021, and coming up on this week's episode, we of course look back on the Formula One Spanish Grand Prix. But there's been so much more in the world of motorsport than just Formula One, as Formula E had an incredible race weekend on the streets of Monte Carlo. Uh, we've got some MotoGP news, some supercars news, quite a lot of supercars news, actually. Uh, Formula Three was racing in Barcelona as well, not to mention the British Touring Car Championship starting their season, DTM having a test, World Endurance Championship news, NASCAR news, and a little bit of WRC as well, all coming your way this week on this week's episode of This Week. Hello folks and welcome back to the channel, welcome back to this week. Uh, thank you, as ever, for your support, for hitting that subscribe button and ringing the notifications bell. Do please share and hit the like button if you do indeed like what you see. Thank you for the merch sales as well, percentage of which goes to charity. Um, let's get things kicked off, shall we? Let's do that. With Formula One, the Spanish Grand Prix at the circuit to Barcelona, Catalonia, a place that the drivers and the teams know inside out. A small alteration to the track this year, leading to a lot of question marks over whether any track alterations or revisions or reversions back to old versions uh, might improve the racing there. But uh, as it was, I think we got a great Grand Prix out of the weekend. It was a Grand Prix that was, yes, born in strategy, but I think that strategy led to a really exciting race, wondering who would do what and when, and Hamilton losing the pole position, losing the lead on the way down to that first corner, his 100th, 100 pole positions in Formula One. Um, and ultimately the strategy playing out very much like the Hungarian Grand Prix in 2019, because with Verstappen taking the lead from the off, actually the advantage swung round to Lewis Hamilton to do what he and what Mercedes had done in, in Hungary, stay out a little bit longer on that first set of tyres and then ultimately turn what they thought was going to be a one-stop race into a two-stop race. So although Verstappen had the early advantage and had the lead from a strategic point of view, it was actually Mercedes that had that advantage. As we are seeing, they look after their tyres a lot better than the Red Bull, which has a peak of early tyre life performance. But over the duration of that tyre life, it's actually Mercedes that can make the best use of it, um, as we saw during the Grand Prix. But um, a real thriller, a really great race. I know a lot of people didn't find it that exciting. I did, but from a, a kind of nerdy strategy perspective, I loved it. I thought it was a really, really good race. Of course, the reason that Mercedes were able to employ the strategy that they did ultimately fell down to the fact that Sergio Perez is not quite at the level he needs to be with the car. The fact that Max and Lewis had pulled out such a gap at the front and with Sergio not being in that gap to sort of stop Mercedes from taking advantage of that gap um, really did play into Mercedes' hands. So, you know, once again, Red Bull with that little bit of a headache that both their drivers aren't, aren't quite firing at the same pace. But then the same is true with Mercedes, Valtteri Bottas, not able to keep up with the same speed as Lewis Hamilton and uh, ultimately at one point holding him up by a bit. Lewis Hamilton, though, spending the weekend coming out very much in favour of his teammate Valtteri Bottas, telling the press to lay off him, you know, give him a break. Why is everybody talking about driver swaps mid-season, uh, throwing his weight very much in Valtteri's corner? On the same weekend when Mercedes said they wanted to get Lewis Hamilton's deal wrapped up, Lewis Hamilton, uh, we believe, wants a new deal to be done by the summer with Mercedes to take him through into 2022 and beyond into the new era of Formula One. Uh, while we're on the Lewis Hamilton news, he says that he learned more about Max Verstappen from following him for as long as he did in the Grand Prix than he ever has in his Formula One career. He was able to really study the way that Max drives, really study the way that he races, the lines that he takes, how he gets the speed out of his car. He was able to learn a huge amount about Max Verstappen's driving style, which um, may well 
come to Lewis's aid later in the year. So a really interesting Grand Prix, not least for the statistic that now, as we look at the season, Lewis Hamilton has won three races to Max Verstappen's one, and yet Hamilton's only led 30% of the laps this year. Verstappen's one led, I should say, not one, led almost 60%. 57% of the laps that we've had this year have been led by Max Verstappen. Hamilton only 30%, and yet it's Hamilton that leads the wins three to one. That, I think, is a really, really interesting statistic. Um, there was a bit of back and forward between Mercedes and Red Bull in the press. Red Bull announcing that they'd signed a, a bunch more people from Mercedes HPP in Bricksworth to go to their new powertrain division. Mercedes then firing back, saying they believed Mercedes had a bit of a flexi rear wing. Red Bull saying that, no... It's all fine by the FIA. There's a little bit of back and forward. Valtteri Bottas putting a bit of a burn on Red Bull on the Thursday press conference, you know, with all the chat about will George Russell replace him mid-season, saying, no, it's not Mercedes that are the team that changed their drivers mid-season. So, yeah, a lot of intrigue, a lot of interest. Um, and that world championship needle, not just between Hamilton and Verstappen, but between Mercedes and Red Bull really ramping up, really firing up and... Uh, yeah, great fun. Really, really great fun. Um, it was also an exciting weekend between McLaren and Ferrari. That battle for third in the Constructors' Championship. Ferrari swinging a bit of a punch back, which they'd failed to land in Portimao, despite out-qualifying both of the McLarens. It was the McLarens that came on stronger in the Grand Prix, as Ferrari struggled with their tyre wear. But in Spain, Ferrari made best use of out-qualifying the McLarens and came home ahead of their respective um, McLarens. So uh, yeah, Ferrari catching up a couple of points in their battle for third in the World Championship with McLaren and behind them the really intriguing battle which now rages between Alpha Tauri, Alpine and Aston Martin over that fifth place in the Constructors' Championship. Alpha Tauri again not quite maximising what they could and should have done in the Grand Prix. Alpine having a stellar weekend once again. Um, I say stellar. They qualified well, ultimately took a gamble on a one-stop strategy when almost everybody else reverted to two. Ocon making it work. Fernando Alonso not quite able to and saying that even at 100%, he isn't quite on the same level as Esteban Ocon at the moment. So a big admission out of Fernando Alonso. Um, Aston Martin not quite there on top 10 pace, even with the upgrades to their car. The same with Alfa Romeo. They need something to happen to the top five teams in order for them to really be looking at seriously being able to challenge for points. They're not quite able to do that on merit right now. But talking about being able to fight for points on merit, Williams so close to fighting for points this weekend and actually were in the points, just outside the points for the majority of the race, took a gamble on strategy. Had the race been five laps shorter, it might have played out for them. George Russell suddenly hitting a cliff with his tyres with about three, four, five laps left to run. Absolutely galling. But George Russell saying the car really came alive. And he really felt good with it for, for the first time this year. Um, another difficult weekend for Haas, but signs of promise once again from Mick Schumacher. Raced as high as, I think, 15th or 16th in the Grand Prix, ahead of the Williams, fighting with Yuki Tsunoda's Alpha Tauri. And while we're on the topic of Yuki Tsunoda, a tough weekend for him, definitely a learning one. Whether his comments about him not having the same car as Pierre Gasly were slightly lost in translation, whether that's what he meant to say, I'm not entirely sure. When he spoke to me over the weekend, the impression I got was very much that he and Pierre were giving different feedback and requiring different things from the car. But certainly the, the, the comments that came out of him elsewhere over the weekend were that he didn't believe he had the same car as his teammate, um, comments for which he later apologised. But um, he will learn that he has to start making use of that brilliant talent, uh, precocious talent, let's say, which he has. Um, yeah, good weekend. All in all, uh, Lewis Hamilton leads the championship. Um, as ever, from Max Verstappen, Valtteri Bottas now moving up into third place uh, ahead of Lando Norris. Uh, meanwhile, Turkey has been put on a red list of countries by the UK. What does that mean? Ultimately, the race which has been brought in to replace the Canadian Grand Prix has had a little bit of doubt 
thrown over it. Um, all parties, as I understand it, are working incredibly hard to find a solution right now for that race, just in order to uh, try to avoid a situation in which British-based F1 teams and personnel would theoretically have to be on the road for six weeks or, or more. So um, a lot of work, as I understand it, going on behind the scenes um, in order to make uh, the best of that situation um, and see, obviously, as many races um, reach fruition uh, as possibly can be in the 2021 season. So watch this space um, as regards that. Formula E now, and you know how they always say you can't overtake in Monaco? Well, step forward, Formula E, because uh, a brilliant race weekend in the Principality for Formula E, which was quite an odd juxtaposition because so often, and I've said this a bit, Formula E can look a bit clunky on its own designed street circuits. The cars almost look a little bit too wide for their tracks and so moves and passes are sort of a bit juttery and a bit clunky and there's a bit damage usually. But as Lucas de Grassi said after the event, it just seemed as though with the show that Formula E was able to put on in Monte Carlo, there is a track that was seemingly created for Formula E, or that Formula E was created for that Monaco track. They used the full Formula One Grand Prix track for the first time, and honestly, it was a wonderful race. Whether it was the pace of the cars, the width of the cars, the use of the boosts, it all just combined to create a, an absolute thriller. Antonio Felix da Costa winning by passing Mitch Evans on the final lap at Nouvelle Chicane, around the outside. Gutsiest move I ever saw, man. Just an incredible move, an incredible move. Um, it was the first time, as I said, that the championship used the full F1 track, and after sort of the embarrassment of Valencia, there's absolutely no denying that the Monaco weekend for Formula E was a massive, success. His move moves Antonio Felix da Costa into fourth place in the Drivers' Championship uh, with Evans in third, De Vries in second. But interestingly, it's the man who came home second uh, in Monaco, Robin Freins, who takes over at the top of the championship. What an insane talent pool Formula E has. Just uh, the depth in quality in that field is right at the top. Talking of amazing talent pools, uh, news from IndyCar, where uh, Andretti has confirmed that Justin Wilson's younger brother, Stefan, will contest the Indy 500 in uh, a sixth car for the team. Uh, meanwhile, Foyt have confirmed a fourth Indy 500 entry for J.R. Hildebrand uh, with a car which is um, it's gonna have a stunning livery. Uh, the number one car uh, calling to mind, um, paying tribute to AJ Foyt's 1961 winning Travis Offenhauser. Uh, beautiful, stunning, stunning livery. Um, also, as we reported last week, Robert Wickens uh, has made a return to the seat of a racing car uh, as he tested um, a Hyundai Veloster TCR car at Mid-Ohio. For Brian Herter Autosport, this car was one specially adapted for, uh, with hand controls for the paralysed former motorcycle champion Michael Johnson and uh, uh, a car that he piloted and pilots, I should say, in the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge. Uh, overall, I think just a hugely generous gift from Herter to Wickens, showing the massive amount of respect, admiration, love felt towards Robert by the entire racing community and a day and an example we hope that will act as a, a door opener for a full racing return for Robert Wickens. MotoGP now and Fabio Quartararo has undergone surgery on his arm after that really troubling difficult race for him in Jerez. He should be fit and healthy to mark his return uh, for the championship's next race which is his home race in France. Supercars now, and uh, Andre Heimgartner took a career first win at the bend, despite a penalty in a wild and wet first race, which saw three leaders on the first lap. Uh, Anton de Pasquale and Cameron Waters won the next two races, but with two podiums over the course of the three races, 
of course, it's Shane Van Gisbergen who still leads the standings. Um, and he's now passed a thousand points for the season. Uh, Win Cup sits second with Davidson in third. Uh, the championship has also stated its intention to push forward with its new for 2022 uh, regulation change. However, it has stated there'll be an, an ongoing review, um, which is a slight backtrack from their kind of, you know, blinkers on, straightforward, no deviation, um, you know, as COVID and, and everything else, you know, affects every championship as they look to the future and whether they will bring in their new regs, you know, as and when was initially intended. Uh, there are also a host of issues outside of you know, pandemic related issues to resolve, um, not least the issue of cost saving, uh, but also fuel delivery and how to balance a six litre push rod Chevy engine with a five litre overhead cam Ford V8. Um, in other supercars news, Hall of Famer, and really the voice of the championship commentator, uh, Neil Crompton has been diagnosed with prostate cancer, but being, uh, being the guy he is actually carried on commentating over the weekend when he was, was given uh, his diagnosis. Uh, he will undergo surgery uh, and we, of course, along with the entire motor racing community, wish him a speedy recovery, a return to full fitness and a return to the microphone as soon as humanly possible. Now, it wasn't just Formula One who was in Barcelona over the weekend. Formula Three had their first weekend of the 2021 championship. Victories for Smolia, Coldwell and Hauger uh, being the headlines out of the weekend. And we saw some great racing. It really was a, a thrilling weekend. The, uh, the new race weekend format, which mirrors that in Formula 2, saw a huge amount of on-track time and on-track action. Uh, Hauger and Coldwell lead the championship standings, level on 34 points, with Smolia actually only 8th after a DNF in race 2 and a no-point score in race 3. Um, it was also a bit of a disappointing weekend for Pierre-Louis Chauvet, who many of you may remember we spoke about a lot earlier this season, um, as he impressed massively in the Asian F3 championship. No points on the board for him but wonderfully points on the board for Juan Manuel Correa marking his return to racing action uh, after a lengthy recovery period for the injuries he sustained um, in the, the horrifying accident which took the life of, of Antoine Hubert back in uh, 2019. Uh, the emotions for him, uh, for his team, for a lot of people actually in racing were, were really evident as he uh, returned to the pits um, but I'm sure for him, just the first step on his road back to the top. BTCC now, the British Touring Car Championship, finally got its 2021 season underway at Thruxton. Uh, and it was Josh Cook who took the first two victories of the week. Can. First race, an absolute thriller. Second race, interrupted by a red flag, safety car period, two massive crashes in that. Um, he couldn't quite make it three from three though. The rain fell at Thruxton. The decision or the indecision of whether to run wet tires or slick tires ultimately saw him not have his tires fitted um, at the correct point before the race started. And he was handed a 30 second penalty. So he never really featured uh, the win in that third race going to reigning champion Ash Sutton. But consistency ultimately ended up being the key for the weekend because it's Jake Hill who leads the championship, having finished on the podium in all three races. Cook is second in the early standings with the evergreen, ever young Jason Plato in third. In the DTM, Maximilian Gutt dominated the three-day DTM test at the Lausitz ring in the HRT Mercedes, topping all three Days Now, the early running had made it seem as though Mercedes were going to have things all their own way. But in the final two days, the AF course Ferraris of Red Bull back Liam Lawson and Alex Albon uh, really came into the mix. The two of those guys uh, finishing the test second and third overall. So a lot of excitement, but also a lot of work to do. I say a lot of work. Let's say a little bit of work to do for BMW and Audi. Uh, the championship, the DTM series, gets underway in Monza in June. World Endurance Championship now slash IMSA news. And just after we recorded last week's episode, it was announced that Penske 
Will Mastermind Porsches return to top line endurance racing in 2023 with an LMP2 LMDH program in both WEC and IMSA? The link up uh, obviously comes after Penske's partnership with Acura ended uh, at the conclusion of last season and has got everybody massively excited. Meanwhile, Glickenhaus have confirmed one car only will be entered uh, for the Portimao race in June. The team has two confirmed entries for the year, but will only have both cars ready for Monza in July. The cars, um, the team's sole car, better if I get the words in the right order, <laughs> will undergo a 30 hour test in Aragon later this month before being stripped down, completely rebuilt in time for Portimao. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the balance of performance rules are dealt with once they arrive, um, especially in light of Alpine's annoyance at the current regulations and how they believe it lost them a shot at victory uh, given the parameters that are put in there over fuel mileage. Over to Japan now, and Super GT's third round at Suzuka has been postponed due to a spike in COVID cases in the Mi Prefecture uh, that the Suzuka race circuit is based in. Um, with the race now likely to be held later in the year, and the chances are uh, without a crowd, the next round of the championship won't take place until July at Mategi. NASCAR has announced the biggest technical shakeup in 50 years as it announced its next gen cars, which it is hoped will be both cost effective and safer and, so the championship hopes, more attractive to OEMs because they're going to look much closer to actual road going cars. Uh, the onus has been put on common parts. Um, to help with cost saving. Uh, but the traditional 5.8 litre V8s remain at the heart of the championship. Uh, in one big change, they're moving from 15 inch to 18 inch wheels and reverting from multiple lug nuts to one singular kind of F1 style central wheel nut, which will have an effect uh, obviously on pit times. Uh, honestly, the cars look great. The concept for the championship looks great. Um, as all series around the world look for viability, cost effectiveness, and of course, excitement and enjoyment for the fan base going forward. Uh, NASCAR was, of course, racing at the weekend. Is there ever a weekend where NASCAR doesn't race? This one, though, one of everyone's favorite weekends of the year and something I'd love to see in other championships, not just in NASCAR. Uh, the throwback weekend at Darlington when racers run classic race liveries. Uh, and it was a race which saw Martin Truex Jr. absolutely demolish the field, leading 248 of 293 laps. It was his third win in a season when no one else has won more than one race, but he doesn't lead the championship. Denny Hamlin still has that honour from Truex Jr. in second uh, and Byron in third. And we finish this week with the World Rally Championship and news that Hyundai has signed Thierry Neuville and Ott Tanak to new multi-year contracts, which will see them continue racing with the squad into the new era of the sport. And it will be a new era powered solely by 100% sustainable fuels. The FIA announcing the WRC will become the first of its championships to do so from 2022. And one last piece of news, and it comes to WRC, which is a fascinating one, a brilliant one, if you want to look at crossovers. There's some great crossovers this year with um, and the likes of Jimmy Johnson leaving NASCAR to go to IndyCar and, uh, of course, Scott McLaughlin leaving supercars to go to IndyCar. Romain Grosjean leaving Formula One to go to IndyCar. But how about this? Former Chelsea, Marseille and Spurs soccer manager, football manager, call it what you will, Andre Villas-Boas has announced he's going to contest this year's Portugal rally. Uh, in the WRC3 category, in a Citroen C3. Um, it's expected probably to be only his uh, WRC run out, uh, as he says he intends to focus his racing future on Rally Raid, having contested the 2018 Dakar in the footsteps of his uncle Pedro. 
Well, there you go then, folks. That is pretty much your lot for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, and as I've already said, and as I say every time, for your support, for your comments and all of your questions, I really do mean them all. Uh, and your support really does mean the world. We'll be back uh, in a few days' time to report on all the happenings over the next few days. So be sure to join us next week when we'll look back on the previous week to bring you next week's episode of This Week. <laughs>